Tonight, we have new video just into out front. This is video from the southern border. We have a drone there, and it captured a group of migrants illegally crossing into California and heading towards U.S. Border Patrol officers. They were able to evade Mexican authorities who say they're ramping up enforcement on their side of the border to keep migrants from reaching the U.S. So our David Culver is out front there at the border in Tijuana, Mexico. And David, it was you and your team who captured this video of these migrants as they were crossing the border. What did you see? How did they do it? Hey there, Aaron. Yeah, we're here with migration officials from the Mexican side. And we've been spending the past couple days trying to get a better sense of these revamped efforts to try to stop folks from illegally crossing. And it's interesting because having covered the border now for several months and going back even more than a year, this is the toughest level of enforcement I have seen at the U.S.-Mexico border. And it's coming from the Mexico side right now. And the video that you pointed out, we were there with Mexican officials as they were showing us some of the vulnerable spots on the wall. And that, to answer your question, is how many of these migrants are still getting through. They'll either, as you can even see behind me, use portions of the wall and have equipment to cut out little squares. And usually they're doing that with smugglers who are backed by cartels and able to get in. Or you can even see up here on this portion of the wall, there's markings higher up, and there's a lot of them. They have made these ladders that essentially they'll throw up and, and then they'll scale up the wall and continue down the other side. Now, when they get to the other side of this one here, they're on U.S. territory, but there's yet another wall in this portion that keeps them from entering the U.S. right away. So they have to be processed, and many of them are trying to get those claims for asylum processed by U.S. officials, Aaron. It is amazing, David, what you're showing us, what you're seeing in plain sight, the markings, the places to throw the ladders up, uh, just, the, the, just seeing it so tangibly. And these crossings, I mean, obviously you've got, uh, you know, the United States has a, has a crisis on its hands. But what's fascinating from what sounds like what you're saying is it's Mexican authorities who are taking action, that residents in Mexico are increasingly frustrated with the migration crisis as well. So what are you seeing on that? So we were hearing that and we wanted to see it firsthand, Aaron, and that's why we came down here and wanted to spend some time with Mexican officials and to see what they have put together as far as these new efforts is quite striking because it, it is in many places along the border much more than you'd see from the U.S. side as far as a law enforcement presence. As far as what residents think, and, and I'm going to show you where we are because this gives a bit of, a bit of uh, context. This is actually um, a neighborhood here. If you, if you pan, this is a, pr a private community that backs up right to the U.S.-Mexico border. And it's interesting because we've been in touch with Met residents on the U.S. side, and, and they're angry, and they have shared with us over the past several months that they have these migrants coming through their property, and that is frustrating them. The same type of frustration is felt here on the Mexico side. And communities like this, this is actually a, a private wall, are dealing with smugglers who will come through, and they'll drop off groups of migrants in areas like this. And then even in this portion, you can see they have pulled back some of the barbed wire on this private cement wall, and they use that then to climb over the actual border wall. And so what has now been the result? Well, the folks in this community have petitioned their state's governor of Baja California, who in turn has had the Mexican National Guard, and we saw this just a couple of hours ago, patrolling neighborhoods like this one. So you have to imagine that, Aaron. You have in your own community National Guards member, at least here on the Mexico side, now coming through and setting up camp in some places to patrol. And tomorrow we're going to have much more on some of the remote camps that Mexican officials have deployed to and set up an infrastructure. And we're going to show you that exclusively when we join you 24 hours from now. Wow, it is absolutely incredible. And, and, and it's just so amazing when you see them actually just walking through the scrub there. It's just that, that instability, that uncertainty uh, that is so pervasive and permeating both sides of the border from what you're showing. All right, David Culver, thank you. David mentioned, and he will have that exclusive report out front tomorrow, that rare look at the conditions on the ground at some of those remote sections of the border wall where he's going to take you uh, tomorrow, and you don't want to miss that. So we'll see you tomorrow, David. All right, and I want to go now to the Democratic Congressman from New York, Tom Suozzi. He's on the House Homeland Security Committee. He won the special election to replace Congressman George Santos in large part because of his focus on border security, which you were incredibly focused on, Congressman Suozzi. So you heard David Culver's report, and I, I don't know if you could see the return, but it is incredibly powerful to look at the wall and see the markings where the ladders are thrown up, where the barbed wire is pulled back. The context here, Congressman, we've got a new Axios poll tonight that finds 42% of Latino adults in America support a wall or a fence along the U.S.-Mexico border. And that 
is not just maybe larger than many listening may expect. It is also up 12 points uh, in the past three years. Should President Biden be hearing this as a blaring wake-up call? Absolutely. This is a problem that the American people are concerned about. And I've always said that the best uh, elected official, the best politician, is the one who says what the people are thinking already. And the people of the United States of America, whether they're Republicans, Independents, or Democrats, are concerned about the border. They're concerned about what they see on your show tonight, uh, what they see as chaos. And, you know, a wall is not going to solve it by itself, but listen, make it part of the solution. Let's get a bipartisan solution like the Senate bill that was negotiated uh, by James Lankford, one of the most uh, honest, ethical, conservative Republicans in the Senate, along with uh, Senator Chris Murphy and Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, Cinema. Uh, uh, let's yeah. use that bipartisan compromise and let's push it forward. Well, part of the reason um, that this is hitting such a chord, there are many reasons, but is also the fear of the, the fear of the unknown. What is coming across the border? Okay. And the former National Intelligence Director James Clapper, I recently had a conversation with him, Congressman. He told me that he's quote very concerned about terrorists exploiting the southern border. He said it was, in his words, a serious national security concern. Uh, in that context, today, the FBI Director Chris Ray warned about his growing concern and I want to use his words directly, about the potential for a coordinated attack here in the homeland akin to the ISIS-K attack we saw at the Russia concert hall. Now, in that Congress hall, concert hall, the Crocus, 144 people were killed. What more do you know about Chris Ray's warning? I know that people are concerned. People are worried. That uncertainty of what's going to happen because of this open border is making people worried. And we have to recognize that, you know, people said to me during my campaign and even now, oh, the border, the border, the border, that's a Republican issue. No, it's not. It's an American issue and we must address it. Now, the president has started addressing it much more. He talked about it in the beginning of his administration. Now he's talking about it more. And I'm hoping he'll take some unilateral action and we can force a bipartisan compromise because we had a deal on the table that was endorsed by the Wall Street Journal, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, even the Border Patrol Union president, who's a big Trumper, endorsed yeah. the deal. And President Trump swooped in and said, oh, I don't want to give Biden a victory. I want to run on the chaos. Well, that's unacceptable. Let's make a deal. <clears throat> Let's actually address this very real problem. All right, you just, uh, as I mentioned, obviously your house, Homeland Security, you did also just return from Ukraine. And so I'm sure that what we heard today from the American general, Chris Cavoli, who happens to be the head of the U.S. European Command and the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, stood out to you. I mean, it stopped me in my tracks. It, he said, Russia's military, again, I want to quote him directly, has grown back to what they were before the war began. I mean, that is incredible, Congressman. We've been, you know, you're hearing about the decimation of the military, their inability to provide for it, their inability to mobilize, mass death of, of, of Russians on the front lines. And now we're hearing they're back to the way they were before the war began. Congressman, it's shocking. I mean, this seems to be proof at least of the inefficacy, the, perhaps even the failure of U.S. sanctions, to say the very least. The sanctions have to be enforced more strongly, but we need to recognize Russia is conscripting more soldiers they're building more weapons plants. But Ukraine has done a fantastic job fighting back. But right now, they're running out of ammunition. And we need to help them. As you heard the Japanese uh, prime minister say today, this is important for all democracies throughout the world. And there was, I was happily uh, surprised to see how much bipartisan support there was uh, for the prime minister of Japan's comments about the need to fund Ukraine and to support Ukraine. That support is in the United States Congress. We need Speaker Johnson to put it on the floor, stop letting Marjorie Taylor Greene and the other extremists block him. Uh, let's get this on the floor. I promise it will pass. All right, well, Congressman Swazi, I very much appreciate your time.